Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of the SAP Fiori Side Chat. We are again very excited to have you join us today. My name is Eugen Winchel and I'm from the SAP UX product management team. And today I'm joined by my co-host, Keith Fisher. Good morning, Good morning Keith. everyone. Good morning. Today's topic for the Fiori Side Chat is the secrets of implementing SAP Fiori. And for that, we have invited again a great round of experts from the SAP family for a panel discussion. In today's round, we have SAP colleagues who have worked on a lot of SAP implementations over the last few years. As such, they know how to use all kinds of tricks to make an SAP Fiori implementation very easy and very successful. And in the next hour, they will share many of their tips and tricks. Today, we have with us Sue Pitten, Paul Thomas, and Javier Baltasar. Welcome, everyone. And we invite all of you to ask questions and comment during our chat. But before we get started, we wanted to set just a few ground rules and over to Keith for that. Yes, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm really excited about this session. So just in the terms of our ground rules, right, we're focusing really on making sure that we're centered around Fury and SAP UX topics. Uh, we promise not to sell you anything, but we certainly are interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, we are part of a larger ecosystem, so we understand that partners join and we welcome you and we've had some great partner uh, related sessions. We just ask you refrain not to promote third party services or tools. So at the bottom of the Zoom window, if you're not familiar with it, is a set of uh, icons and they include one for chat. So if you open that up and uh, and have that available to you. You can actually introduce yourself virtually there. Um, we also have a series of uh, buttons that will control your mute and or video settings. So if you are interested in participating, feel free to go ahead and unmute yourself. But in the meantime, if you're not speaking, please just leave yourself on mute. Uh, we are a fun conversation. We are informal, but let's keep things as professional, as respectful as possible. And with all of that, hard stuff out of the way. I'd like to turn it over to uh, our panel to just briefly introduce themselves. So Sue, if you could spend a few minutes and just introduce yourself to the rest of the group. Thank you, Keith. Uh, yes, so my name is Susan Pitten. I am, have been with SAP for over 20 years. And I am um, part of the organization that, that helps global pre-sales demonstrate our solutions. Um, so my role is to run the uh, UX and integration teams and make sure that we have all the Fiori content activated for every single um, sales uh, demonstration that we do. Um, so that's why I'm here today. Great, thank you. Welcome, Sue and Javier. Please introduce yourself. Uh, okay, uh, I am a UX architect in the Latin America region. So I support a lot of customers in their implementations of Fury and S4. And I also work for the S4 HANA regional implementation group. In the rig, we support all customers globally in their move to S4 HANA and Fury adoption. So uh, I have a lot of experience with supporting many customers from various regions. Oh, thank you, Javier. It's great to actually have you. I mean, there's wonderful things to say about the rig and I'm sure we'll get into a little bit of them as we go. And certainly not least, Paul, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Yes, for sure. My name is Paul Thomas. I'm a part of the SubUX product management team, as well as Eugen and uh, Keith, but uh, have spent quite some time in consulting. So 14 years in front-end consulting, starting from the as a peanut viewer portal, up to the mobile stuff, and nowadays Fury as well. Um, before then, for, for four to five years now, in the product management team and some architecture roles within the SAP development organization. Great, welcome, Paul. Hey, and before I turn it back over to Eugen, I also wanted to say that there was one more button underneath in the bottom of your Zoom panel, and that's for questions and answers. So if you'd like to have a question answered on your behalf, go ahead and open up that panel. You can ask questions along the way. We sometimes would take a little time to get to it, uh, just as we try to keep things ordered, but please go ahead and ask your questions in, in that window as well. So with that, uh, turn it over to you, Eugen, to get it started. And actually, before we get started with the panel, let's do a quick poll because we would like to see of how much or where you are in your SAP Fiori implementation. It's the audience participation piece. We also have one at the end, everybody. Yeah. So uh, we try to keep things interesting and you know, the panelists don't get to answer. Otherwise, that would be quite self-serving. So <laughs> actually quite nice. Like we have a very nice mix of uh, everything from uh, a lot of comp like the whole company runs on SAP Fiori applications and uh, down to interested in starting very soon. Okay, uh, talking about starting now, let's start with the panel discussion. Ladies first. Uh, Sue, we have heard a lot from customers that they see Fiori implementations as 
challenging sometimes, don't know exactly where to start and how. You and your team actually implement every SAP pure application that is being released by SAP. So what is your secret and how do you approach the implementations? Yeah, so I mean, just as, as a point of introduction, I just shared my slides. Um, you know, again, as I mentioned, we support global pre-sales uh, folks. So it's really important that we uh, are, um, have every single Fiori app activated in our demo landscape so that we can show that and share that with our customers. And, and so we often consider ourselves as a first SAP customer. We implement as soon as we get uh, the release as quickly as possible and try to get it out to the field as, as quickly as possible. Um, we also activate every single Fiori app that there is. So we don't really discern, you know, whether it, we need it or not you know, we, we pretty much assume that we need those Fiori apps. Um, I'm fortunate to have um, a very small UX team that does these activities. I have a lead UX architect and about three to four um, consultants that work with him um, that perform these activities, but we perform these after an upgrade, and um, we perform um, procedures in eight s 4 han premise landscapes. And also, we also do some of these activities in the 15 S4 cloud environments that we support for our demos. Um, why do we have so many? Well, um, again, because this isn't a productive landscape like our customers would be, but we um, have to support uh, industry demos, ind industry solution demos. Um, we also have to keep these environments up to date. And so some of them are a little bit, you know, get upgraded on time. Other ones stick out there for a longer period of time. So we do have, you know, a, a strong life cycle of trying to make sure that we always have the latest and greatest, but we have to support some older things as well. We also support, you know, both embedded and external gateways with s on prem So we we're familiar with doing activities around both of those things. And as I mentioned, we have over 1500 of the UI5 apps really activated and running in our environments. And we support over 3,000 pre-sales people that demonstrate our solutions every day. So without taking a lot of time, um, you know, I was, I had my team kind of pull together, um, you know, what are the steps that they take, you know, post upgrade and, and, you know, how do we, how do we manage this right in such a complex environment with having to do this in so many systems. And again, not every, we don't do it in eight systems you know, at the same time, right? Typically there are, you know, industry systems might be a little bit lagging as, as far as when they can, you know, uh, uh, um, upgrade uh, for various reasons. So we have to keep, you know, a very strong task list of what we do everywhere. And if we do it in one place, we have to remember to do these things in the other. You know, you know if, is it a particular UI5 patch that we find works better than others? We have to remember to, to make sure that gets into the others. So we do keep a very strong, you know, um, operational list of what we have to do post upgrade. And this is just a big picture here of, of what that is. Again, um, once the system is updated, um, we, we begin our um, post upgrade activities. And um, that includes, of, of course, the UI5 uh, libraries and patches, maybe taking a look at the kernel updates that might have to occur. Um, we regularly clear the cache after this process. We find that's a good practice um, and also replicate all of the catalogs, you know, to the back ends um, and the search connectors, et cetera, for Fiori. You know, after these big picture things, um, then we really take a look at the content that's new. And as I mentioned, again, we don't really discern which Fiori apps we want to use. We assume we need to, we activate all content in all solutions and in all industries. Um, so we really just take a look at what's the net new content that we have to activate. And we, we download all of that from the Fiori apps library um, and we start to activate that. Um, as you know, some of the tools have come up, come around over the years, right? We, we take advantage of the mass activation of OData services using a task list. That's something that's been very helpful to us, uh, of course, with doing so many apps every time. Yeah. And, and also the activation of the um, SICF services that have to be done. Um, then probably a larger part of the, the, the process is really is around the release notes, right? So with so many apps that we activate, we, we definitely need to make sure that there, if there's any notes um, that we have to consider, any follow-up steps, um, we do have to comb through those steps and, and, um, and make sure that we perform them. And again, the great thing is once we do it in one landscape, we document it so that we mem remember that this is what we have to do in, in future landscapes that we upgrade. Um, so that um, that brings us down to again, we're almost ready to return this content over to our content team. So you know, these are the folks that set, make sure that the, the demonstrations are set up and that there's this um, 
a demo story that goes with the content that's there. Um, but before we do that, we run a number of, of smoke tests. And this, this is typically around this, the various UI pieces that are in the Fiori Launchpad, just to make sure things work. You know, is the, is the Fiori search working correctly? Um, does the inbox get in e emails? Do, do each of the types of UIs that are there, do they, they uh, execute uh, well? Um, you know, do KPIs render properly? So some, some typical things that we've isolated over the years that sometimes we find go wrong with a UI patch or something like that. We, we run those smoke tests before we turn it over to get ready for that productive landscape um, before it goes to the field. And then, and then finally, again, the content team works on their stuff. They, they update the demo stories um, and they make sure that everything is functional, that the data is there. Again, we don't have live data like a customer in all cases, but, but we work to make sure that 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 uh, the data supports the app so that they demonstrate well. And then again, we turn it over to our pre-sales folks so that they can begin to demonstrate out of those systems. Um, and just you know, one more transition here. I did put roughly how long it takes us um, for each of these steps. Um, again, each system is a little bit individual. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit longer, but the overall process before we, as we begin the upgrade to when we release it to the field, takes in between four and six weeks, um, depending on the amount of work and the number of apps that we're activating. Um, and of course, on an ongoing basis, once we do release the landscapes, you know, we, we support, um, you know, investigating problems with, with any Fiori app that might occur and, and troubleshooting that with the teams. And again, those things, we, we again, we keep a constant list of those things. Once they happen one time, you know, is there something that potentially could happen the next time we upgrade or will it happen in the next landscape that we upgrade? So we, we do a really good job of, of keeping um, track of these types of things. And I just wanted to end, um, my team provided some of the, the more useful links and notes that they, they look at and they keep updated on um, as it relates to, to doing these things as a, uh, on a regular basis. So I, I included those links for everyone's benefit here. If you're not aware of them, I hope they're helpful. So again, I hope that helps a little bit, give a little bit of a view of, of again, probably SCP's largest Fiori customer, um, but I'm happy to take some questions or, um, you know, turn it over. Very great overview. Thanks a lot for sharing that. Yes. Yeah, so we actually had uh, we actually had a couple of questions in here. Uh, Rongo, you uh, uh, said that you had a question with regards to Fury Elements and annotations. I'm sorry. We'll go ahead and catch that. Uh, we'll speak a little bit later in the tools section uh, uh, for you there. Um, that's quite a comprehensive list there, Sue. I'm I'm wondering from your perspective, I mean, is every release the same? I mean, does it all take about the same six weeks or are they certain types of releases that take a lot more time, raise a lot more notes or is everything more or less at this point fairly streamlined for you and your team? Yeah, you know, I would say in the early days of S4, I think there was a lot more work every time there was a, a release or a feature pack. Um, um, but I think we have found overall that, um, you know, even with the major releases that come out in on-prem every year, that the process is pretty straightforward and we, we yeah. find it, we, can, we can pretty consistently make a plan and expect that the upgrade goes as planned. Um, you know, every once in a while, of course, there'll be, um, you know, something that comes up. Um, you know, obviously we have a really complicated landscape. So not only do we have all these Fiori apps activated, but we have integrations to every single cloud solution in these landscapes. Um, we've acted, activated a lot of integrations to desktop applications as well as to, to our partner solutions in our demo environment. So, you know, I would say our upgrades are probably not typical of every customer and so they can be complicated and we do find some hiccups there but I think they're that overall we again we learn from each one and um, of course we, we provide that feedback back to SAP um, and we think SAP makes the product stronger um, when we when we provide that feedback. Great well thank you and so Javier I noticed you know obviously you don't uh, when you walk into a customer situation they don't necessarily have this uh, well organized a process here so what are you know with all the work on your customer projects what are some of the best practices that you've established developed over time that you can share with the audience i guess that there's three main best practices the first one is defining a ux strategy this will tell you which are the internal and external factors or uh, issues or stuff that influences the business that you need to consider in order to use uh, the solution. For example, let's talk about pre-COVID-19 era. Pre-COVID-19 era, Fiori was not very important. We had a lot of customers that were thinking on Fiori as probably 
something nice or the tip of the iceberg or something that would be nice to have. Now that we are in COVID area, we have external factors, environmental factors that need the business to switch their strategy and focus on providing external access, for example. That's where Fiori fits. And that's part of the UX strategy that the business must define. Defining this UX strategy not only helps you with stuff, environmental uh, effects like COVID, but also helps you define a business vision, what will be the value for the business once you provide uh, a solution like SAP Fury. You will also be capable of finding a high level roadmap. Maybe you're starting in classic ERP or business suite, and in the next five years, you're planning to move to s hana So you need to consider all of that and probably that, build, that helps you build a roadmap on how you will transform. Something that customers also need to always remember or what I always tell them is that our proposal with Fury is business transformation. We're providing new technologies, we're providing new features, and that all has uh, an influence or influences the way you work right now. So eventually you need to transform in order to take the most out of Fury. My second best practice or my second advice for everyone is to always try to consider a UX expert role. This UX expert role, I'd suggest not only being one person. Uh, I've seen customers that consider the UX expert, expert just one guy that would take control of the complete project. Uh, customers that tend to do that or that do that tend to fail because there are a lot of activities and a lot of responsibilities that the UX expert need to take, needs to take care of. So, for example, he needs to talk with the project manager, he needs to talk with the uh, analytics experts, and align the vision from the entire project team and also from the business in order to take the most out of the solution. And I guess that my third best practice is also to understand how SAP proposes customers to tackle the projects. We always propose using the activate methodology and in that activate methodology with all the phases of the methodology, there are some important steps and some important considerations that you need to take care of while you're going through all the phases. For example, if you're going through the first phase discovery, you at least need to understand the main concepts of project planning and how to scope the project. And for example, while you're going through the explore and realize phase, you need to identify what needs to be adapted, which are the out-of-the-box features of SAP Fiori that you can take uh, or you can use directly out of the box and communicate that to your, to your end users. You also need to consider which are the tools for extensibility, how to use them, what are the innovations in, in all of these areas, because when we provide Fiori in s hana we're not only providing apps, we're also providing new ways of working. An example that probably not I've seen that not all customers are aware of is the in-app extensibility apps in SAP Fury. Do you guys know that you can modify um, multi-dimensional report via a Fury application? Or do you know that you can configure workflows via another Fury app? All that stuff helps you uh, configure and adapt the system in an easier and faster way than what you did when you had Business Suite or the classical ERP. So I guess that these are my three main best practices. I mean, it, it tests a lot. It's probably a lot of stuff, but I suggest all customers and, and everyone to at least consider these three main steps when they approach a project of Fury. So Javier, we have uh, Emiliano who asked a question in, uh, in the Q&A area here around, uh, you know, the most, the most difficult or most common challenges that customers have today when they start the transformation. I mean, you speak about business transformation and we know that so many customers are really first taking that migration, a technical migration step. What's the, what is it that you, know, you do or you tell these customers in order to convince them that business transformation uh, it, it, it needs to be done or is of value or are there other things that are really uh, big challenges that we haven't spoken about so far? Well, that's, that's a really good question. I won't say that it's easy. It's just a five minute conversation. It takes a lot of effort, but the way I try to approach that is actually convincing them of 
all the new features, all the innovations, and how this will have effect on their business processes. So uh, I'll try to answer this with an example, probably something that I just referred to earlier. This new workflow, uh, flexible workflow. Uh, a few weeks ago, I was talking with a customer and they did not want to implement Fury. And it came with the COVID stuff that they want to activate or enable my inbox application so they can enable workflows via public internet and through the mobile devices. They have no configuration around uh, purchase orders. So they asked me, we need to do this in less than five days. We have our partner here. Uh, we need to make this as fast as possible with little investment. So what do you propose? Okay, so this is like the, one of the uh, scenarios where Fury becomes uh, a priority and helps you modify all of that. Because my proposal was, okay, you can use flexible workflow with purchase orders. That means you need to activate one Fury app, one additional Fury app. You need to configure the workflow directly from this app. From this app, you can also create variants of that workflow and that should take you less than two days. So you have that covered in two days. And we need to activate my inbox app. With Fiori in s 4 in an embedded system, activating my inbox should take you uh, less than one day, even considering the new rapid activation. So we were talking about three days to have all the technical and functional configurations. And we dedicated one extra day for the network and uh, all the architecture definitions. So in four days, we actually solved their issue. And we, were, we would not have been able to do that if it were not for Fury in s 4 and all these new features. They are now convinced that using Fury is the way to go. And now actually after four days, they're asking me, what else can I do? So that's the way I try to approach that. It's usually demonstrating and having something tangible that they can see, they can feel. Otherwise, it becomes an ethereal discussion where a uh, customer will not be able to see the business of the platform. Great, thank you. And jumping in this, Paul, so basically from my point of view, it's all about uh, so the number one topic is all about the visibility, right? So as uh, Xavier already nicely showed with this UX expert, which is not like having uh, someone sitting in the or having in the org chart someone uh, as a as a UX expert, but it's more the the visibility and the awareness of the topic that everyone knows. Okay, it's it's uh, of importance. So you said from an architecture point of view, you look into um, how to tackle the, the UX topic. Um, that the functional experts are aware. What are the the Fiori apps which are available uh, in their line of business, and say they might to look into. Um, because that's always an important when doing the step from an uh, ECC system, from a business suite system to S4HANA. You have a lot of uh, end users who, who have been used to working with a, with a sub uh, GUI for Windows, who have their best practices, their routines, and this kind of change management you have to do. That's, from my point of view, a and, and, and very important aspect. From a technical point of view, and I think that's what, what Sue just nicely demonstrated, um, having eight systems on premise, 15 in the cloud, doing this, it's still some uh, still efforts. You still have to do it. You still need the knowledge. You need the experts. And I think here perhaps uh, being an, an advantage to the teams that they are doing it quite often, quite regular. Customers doing perhaps these kind of uh, adoption and updates only every second year or something like that, but not uh, uh, consuming each single uh, feature pack and support package. Um, but from a technical point of view, we, we have improved the tooling. And I think there was a, a question by Ram as well, mentioning that it was quite cumbersome uh, in, in business read times, uh, finding out uh, what is comp uh, compatible with each other, what is the minimum requirement on the back end to have a specific app running and so on and so on, as well setting up all the infrastructure, activating the services and so on. That was quite cumbersome, but I think we, we, we have quite done quite some improvements uh, on our journey. For sure, still not at the end. So um, with, with rapid activation, as uh, Javier and I uh, ex explained, um, you can really um, do an activation, this mass activation of the applications very fast. 
But nevertheless, there's still room for improvement, something we are working on, um, where we are always looking for the, for the feedback from the different customer projects, from uh, our internal colleagues like Sue doing the, the implementations. But long, long, long sentence or long speech, the, the bottom from my point of view is really having the awareness in, in all areas, that, that there is awareness for UX, that there is awareness of, of, uh, um, uh, for Fury, and that you're not just uh, doing a technical conversion from a business suite system to an, um, to an S4HANA, but as Javier said, there is a business transformation next to it, and uh, UX is just one part of it, and you have to, to address it in, in that way. And that's something which I've realized uh, or I, I've seen with a lot of customers I've worked with that uh, kind of number one step is having this established, this UX mindset that making people aware of what does UX mean, how to manage UX. So um, it needs as well from a knowledge point of view, um, perhaps people are uh, familiar with doing the, the monitoring of, uh, of the uh, traditional transactions, but when then you have the the web on top, you have CUI 5 on top, doing a proper management uh, and operations of the system, that's really key. And at the end, it's all a, bu a people business, having the change management, uh, taking the end users with you, involving the key users, uh, making them familiar uh, with, the, with the new concepts, as Xavier said, with the, with the, with the in-app extensibility. So all the power we are as well giving to the key users, allowing them to, to come up with, with new ideas and new best practices for the end users. That's uh, something they really must be familiar with. They, they must be, feel well with the new system and that's really key. So taking the people with, uh, with us on the journey. Thanks, Paul. Hey, uh, so Sue, I'm interested from your perspective, right? You're, we're, we're talking a little bit about the roles and the responsibilities here, and we talk about the users. I mean, from knowing that you have to basically, you know, uh, uh, continue to, uh, to enable all of these 1,500 uh, apps each time, I mean, what's your level of engagement with, uh, with the people who are actually presenting things? Do they come directly to you with problems and issues? Uh, you know, you, you said that you have somebody who represents a UX architect there, but are they really, you know, kind of business experts at that point? Or, you know, how, how, do, how do you reflect the, you know, the needs of the user, or is this something just a pass through back into uh, the development teams? Yeah, I mean, we, we have, um, you know, for every single solution, you know, finance, manufacturing, retail, whatever the solution is, we have what we call content owners, or you could, I think they would be like a business architect from a customer perspective, right? They're the expert in using the solution and, and you know, kind of the bridge between the technical side and, and the end user. And so it's really their role um, to make sure that, you know, the apps are, are fully working. And again, you know, we, we don't really provide training on a regular basis on every single app, but we do publish um, demonstration scripts, right? So if a, if a new app comes out that we feel is is something that you know is really important that they know about it, we we put it in a demo script, and we publish that information through the channels you know usually related to that solution. So finance would get their finance channels someone else. So my team as sort of the cross product team though we we end up getting the tickets right. So if you know if someone has a problem. Um, out there and they're demonstrating it. Um, it could be their own problem, right? It could be that they just don't get how something works, right? right. Um, as easy as Fiori is, right? Every once in a while, people just, you know, don't click on something or they expect a behavior and they're not getting it and they create tickets. And then my team will typically be the first ones that look at these issues. You know, a lot of issues come through, they end up being data problems also yeah. that something, someone did something with the data in the background, but they typically come through us first to take a look and, and troubleshoot if, if, you know, is it, is it truly a problem with the UI um, or with the Fiori app? Okay. That actually gets to a point where it always comes up and somebody was asking really about uh, this in the in the questions Roy was asking about how much how much time is spent on optimizing you know performance here uh, once applications are are deployed uh, you know from your perspective Sue, and then I'll hand it over to others what you know what's your what, you know what's your answer to that question you know I, I wouldn't say that we spend a lot of time 
after every release worrying about that. Um, our, our optimizations, again, tend to be more of a problem with the end user. In our case, it's a pre-sales person that's demonstrating, demonstrating the software. Um, a lot of times they're, they're so afraid that they won't have an app on their Fiori Launchpad that they add 150 apps to their Fiori Launchpad, which perhaps doesn't lead to the best performance. But, it, you know, I, I, you know, that's where we come, again, my team comes in often to try to enable them, right? That's not best practice. That's not how we would expect our, our customers to use our solutions. We want those Fiori apps on that homepage to be the most touched, the most used apps, you know, that they use 90% of the time. And then they can always click on the app finder, right, to add or, or find an app that they don't use all the time, but they need on a fly. And um, it's it's a hurdle, like it just I, I'm sure it is with customers, right? Getting people to change, they're afraid. You know, I think if you go back to the SAP GUI days, right? These some, many of these folks have been around for a lot of years at SAP. They're used to having every single transaction in the entire system at their fingertips through a menu, right? Or through a, a fast path. And they're afraid, right? That if it's not on their Fury launch pad, they're not gonna be able to do that. But again, it's for us, it's an enablement and a usability. We wanna, we wanna preach the fact that Fiori gives you that capability. You can find it in the app finder on the fly and um, even go to the SAP menus if you have to. Uh, so Javier, from your perspective, what's what you know percentage of time is really spent on you know performance tuning and optimization after uh, you know after a customer deployment? Well, as Sue mentioned, we do have a best practice, and it's exactly what Sue mentioned. We don't have we don't want customers to have thousands of uh, Fury apps in their launchpad. So if customers are following that best practice, you really don't need to worry about uh, a lot of performance issues for transactional apps where we do find some issues around performance is when customers enable a new analytical app. Analytical apps yeah. may end up consuming a large data set and consuming a large data set may have an impact not in the HANA memory, but in CPU consumption. Mm. So if you're using a new analytical app, you do need to go around test it in your QA system, try to find out which would be the causes for an issue in performance, and then correct that and move those corrections to production. But those, that's the most common case for transactional peer applications, you really don't need to worry. Yeah, and I think everybody falls in love with those beautiful visuals when they show up on a tile on the screen, right? And they, yeah. they don't necessarily realize exactly how much work is behind the system and, and actually rendering that data or how frequently that happens. So, uh, you know, I think, Paul, do you, do you have other kind of ideas or suggestions here when people are getting it through their initial deployment and, you know, having some concerns or worries about, you know, performance and performance tuning? From my point of view, performance is not a one-time effort, right? You should uh, have some monitoring implemented and then uh, all the time looking into uh, how your system uh, operates, how your system behaves. Um, in regards to performance, I think there are some uh, kind of uh, issues which are often happening, as Xavier just explained, with the uh, with, uh, analytical apps. If you put uh, too much data in, into it uh, or if you have too many apps on the, on the launch pad. But you can have multiple reasons or there are a lot of reasons for, for performance issues. So just looking on the, uh, on the SAP system itself um, is typically not uh, sufficient, but if you really want to um, take care of performance and want to be aware of what's happening with your system, you should uh, see that you have kind of an end-to-end -end -end performance uh, monitoring, which allows you to look into the full distance from the end user, from the client, um, down to the database and looking into all aspects um, uh, which, which come true. This allows you then really look into uh, root causes of performance. Because in, in most cases where I've been involved, it had been often that perhaps a firewall had been misconfigured and you had some delays over there. You had some network uh, glitches which uh, must had to be solved. And um, these, these kind of things. So um, sometimes it's even multiple factors coming together, which is then ending up in a, in a bad performance. So that's from my point of view, um, really key to have this uh, performance monitoring. Um, you could use uh, tools. I think there is a, um, you might know of solution manager from the past. Now you have the focused run offering of, of SAP, um, which allows you with a real user monitoring 
um, quite some intensive possibilities um, to do this kind of performance monitoring. And um, so for me, it's uh, important. Yes, you can do this one-time effort and, and, and double check your system, which, which uh, might be a very good idea. Um, but besides that, is already think about how can you get it into um, your daily setup? How can you ensure that performance is always good uh, and that you're always looking into, into performance? And in the best case, you even uh, realize that performance is not as good as it should be before the end users even realize it, right? Um, that's uh, the best case if you have your kind, some kind of prediction into it um, to, to see what's happening within the system. So um, I think that's really, uh, from my point of view, the... So Paul, you mentioned, you mentioned uh, performance and other standardized things. Uh, we have a, a question regarding Fiori elements and how, to, how uh, we can create SAP Fiori custom apps using Fiori elements. Is that possible completely to build a Fiori application out of Fiori elements? Yes, definitely. And, and I think that's uh, exactly when, when looking into it. And I think that's the best practice from our internal S4HANA development teams as well, that I think roughly 80% or something like that of our standard apps we are delivering are based on Fiori elements. So that gives you a little bit uh, the overview that most of the use cases you should be able to cover with uh, Fiori elements. And I think that we all as well already create Fiori side chat sessions on Fiori elements, even a deep dive uh, with, the, with the experts. So it might be worth looking at uh, YouTube and, and double check the recordings. Um, because I think the templates we are providing with Fiori elements give you a lot of opportunity to, to come up with your own custom apps. But for sure, there might be special cases where you would like to have some special setup where you really look into freestyle your sub your 5d development and where a few elements might not be sufficient but as mentioned with a sample from the standard development for most of the cases your elements should be really um, matching quite good and that's something what we are experiencing as well um, in, in, in fury maker setup so for for the ones who are not familiar with that one that's basically a one week workshop where we are running with, with customers to look into what's uh, coming up with a, with a business challenge and see how can we best solve this from a UX perspective um, with a Fiori application. And typically we use Fiori elements here as well because this allows us to come already up with a with first prototype in the system at the end of the week. So after five days already have a first prototype for sure, it's not yet with the globalization, translation, and so on. So it's not yet uh, global production ready. Um, still some work to be done. But the first prototype, which you can run your end user through in five days, um, sounds like a good approach, right? And yeah. um, I think that's where, where few elements really helpful. And thanks for the reference. Yes, we had like two great sessions with Peter Spielvogel um, on, on the uh, few elements overview and then deep dive. Um, that was a great session that, uh, as you said, like uh, we have on, on YouTube. So check it out if you want to. And um, maybe like, because we're just on, on Fiori Elements, uh, how, how does it look like with an ECC backend stack uh, or system with Fiori Elements? That, that's as well. Uh, I think you, ha you have some, some limitations, but we have customers who are, who are running quite good with it. Um, as, especially in regards to the annotations on top, that's something um, which, which uh, require some, some manual efforts as well. But um, basically it works as well. So we, we had customers uh, working with customers um, who did the custom development on top of the ECC system and even integrating third party systems um, from, I think in this case, it was Microsoft SharePoint, which was an easy one because then you have the whole data services at hand as well. Um, so that was something which we, which is definitely possible as well. As said, um, you might have some, some limitations because you do not get the annotations out of the box. And, um, that's something where it is a little bit more convenient on the S4HANA stack. Um, but from a technical point of view, definitely possible. And, um, you can leverage then the standalone annot annotation modeler on top, um, to, to manually do your annotations. So um, for the ones who are still on, on ECC and um, want to, to get into this new setup and want to, to see how this uh, Fiori Elements, how it works, uh, you can already start on the ECC. But yes, for sure, it becomes more convenient when being on the S4HANA stack because then the end-to-end -end story is much, uh, much better um, and you have much uh, more, more tooling around and more support 
more out of the box support uh, available as well. And I think just to, to, to jump, I think uh, scanning always the question, there was one question on the uh, NetWeaver business client or the SAP business client as it nowadays called. Um, and if it's an either or, so should I go with a, with a NetWeaver business client or with the SAP business client or should I go with Fiori Launchpad? And um, it's, uh, you can combine it, right? So the, the SAP business client allows you as well to, to have the Launchpad there. And um, it comes with the advantage that the business client allows you to combine the web and the uh, SAP GUI for Windows. Um, so if you would like to stay with a, with a well-known sub GUI for Windows, then the SAP business client might be uh, one opportunity or might be one, one option um, to, to consider. Um, otherwise, um, if you go without the business client, then you're in the, in the browser and then you're in the web world and then you're going with a SAP GUI for, for HTML support. Um, which is yeah. very fast, very good as well nowadays, yeah. right? So. Yeah, I, I would add to that. I think, you know, um, obviously we, when we transitioned right from ECC to S4 and all of our landscapes, um, that was a big thing. And as the content got built up, especially some of the SAP GUI for HTML transactions also became available in S4, the need to have NetWeaver Business Client or SBC, you know, was less and less. And I would say now, you know, from a demonstration perspective, we demonstrate 100% out of the um, Fury Launchpad. All of our content is there. There are, a, I think, a handful of remaining HTML apps that are have, I think, typically more of a integration perhaps to Gantt charts or something like that, that where they need an ac access to a full blown SAP GUI capability. And in those cases, we ask them to use the Fury Launchpad inside SAP Business Client so that it gets the full functionality of Network Business Client, but they're using the, they're still using the same Fury Launchpad that they would use um, through the web. That's great. So uh, a couple of questions actually for Javier. So one one of the questions have come up from uh, Keegan is you know talking about the idea of uh, try. I'm uh, sorry, this is from Lee. The, the idea of trying to get somebody uh, to embrace the role of a UX architect, which you indicated that is important, given all the other expenses uh, and the budget constraints that they have for technical architects and solution architects in the project. You know, what do you tell customers to be able to convince them for the value here? Uh, yeah, that's also a difficult discussion. Um, I would say that they'll get they get convinced once you show them the results. There's no, unfortunately, in my experience, there's no other way of doing this. Uh, and if they, if it's been difficult to to do that, is it a hat that one of the others can wear, or or do you not recommend that? There's some stuff. Uh, let's say that you'll need the entire team to have a minimal level of knowledge around SAP Fury. For example, Fury troubleshooting, that would be perfect that all the members in your team know about Fury troubleshooting. So that's something that you can delegate to everyone, but they will still need someone to take the lead. For example, someone that will tell them, yeah, I don't want you to build a catalog with 150 apps. I just want you to build a catalog with 10. Uh, I want I want all the analytics guys to use, uh, for example, the in-app extensibility applications. Uh, that that's difficult for a lot of customers to understand. So, in my experience, only when you have been able to show the value of this this role is when they notice that they need it, and it's always a big challenge in in a project because. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest here, most of the of the businesses and most of the market is not aware of the need of the UX expert. So that's something we're working on, but it will still take time to for everyone to understand the need of this role. Okay. And so and that's uh, off. Go ahead. Just that, and that's often what, what I do see as well. So from time to time, jumping into customer escalations as well. And when it's about um, escalation on Fiori and on the UX topic, it's typically that you realize there is no one looking after the topic, right? Um, and then, uh, as, as Xavier just said, the best practices, what to do, what not to do. Um, yes, they are somewhere documented, 
but uh, if you do not have a, a guy who's experienced with the topic, then you might miss them, right? And um, therefore, um, a lot of customers are learning that uh, the tough way, right? Um, because they are rolling it out and then they, they get the complaints from the end users and then they have to revisit then the topic again uh, because they haven't made it in the first shot. Um, and as well from a tooling point of view, um, I think with a, with a rapid activation, which we already mentioned, with the um, innovation discovery, with the Fury Apps reference library, with the lighthouse scenarios, with the readiness checks, with the Fury recommendations, with the uh, content manager, and so on. So there are so many tools out there which, which help you. And uh, having someone who guides you a little bit through the tools, when to use what, which, uh, which tool for which phase, and so on, that's definitely, definitely helpful. And the UX guy stand alone will not be able to, to solve all your issues as well, right? Because um, you, you might have an, an, an expert in Fiori Apps reference library, knowing it in and out and looking up uh, all the details. But if you don't have the, the functional knowledge, the process knowledge, um, all the uh, information you're getting out of the Fiori App reference library does not help you in, uh, any, any longer, right? So it's always a combination of the functional knowledge, of the architectural uh, knowledge, and this combined with the UX topic then it's really become valuable. And therefore, for, for my point of view, that's uh, the, the role of the UX architect. There is a, a lot about communication, right? So it's not uh, sitting somewhere uh, in, a, in the basement and coming right. up, now right. I have the best UX concept ever, but it's a lot of alignment, lots of discussion, lots of uh, uh, conversation you are having with the different people involved in such a project. Um, and at the end, it's a lot about change management because oh, as we... Sure touch yeah. the topic with the web GUI and so on. It's always the little things which might have an impact on the on the end users. And then doing proper change management is really key. Right. And okay. just to add to Paul's comment, it's also about proactivity. You want someone that's proactive and proposes stuff to the business. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, uh, they won't notice that there's new stuff and new features, new solutions that they could use. So, yeah. And so, Sue, speaking about productivity, what, you know, what is the most uh, frequently used uh, app uh, within, the, uh, within the app reference library that you see at least, or at least see demoed from, from the teams that you support? If somebody had asked whether or not, uh, which are the best apps to showcase to a customer? I presume they're usually the same thing. Um, yeah, you know, I, I don't have a specific one or two. I, I, um, I often don't get involved in the end result of these things, but I would say, you know, overall, I mean, the, the, the team, of course, likes to showcase the overview pages, which are the cards, have all the cards on them. Um, those are very impactful, and I think almost every single one of those is also considered a Lighthouse app. Um, and then I think the other thing it would be just lighthouse apps in general, right? So I think, you know, when you look at the ones that really have some some key innovations in them and and added value to the end user, um, and I think in the in the Fury Apps library you can filter by lighthouse apps and see which which apps are lighthouse apps. And I again we've tried to make sure that the content teams in our case not only do we have them activated but that we have those ones featured in demo scenarios so that pre-sales knows to share those. Okay, cool. Uh, Javier, there's a kind of a related question to this is trying to find uh, the right team that's driving fury within an organization. Uh, Stigliani uh, had mentioned, uh, you know, which which group should be doing that the web development team, the enterprise portal team. Do you have any thoughts there? Um, your user experience expert. <laughs> I mean, if, if you go with only the web development team, their vision will be limited to development. So as we mentioned, they may not have a complete vision and they will, may not be able to take the most out of the solution. The role of the UX expert, it, it's a mix. So you need someone who's, who knows around stuff around architecture, who's aware of the new development paradigms, probably the ABAP programming model for Fury or the ABAP RESTful programming model. You need also someone in that team to be aware of the UX design for the Fury Launchpad. So yeah. it's difficult to still, find. <laughs> still got to manufacture that guy, right? Find that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We have to figure out how to train and, and build that person. Somebody asked, can you create a workflow from a Fury app? You hinted at that. Is, uh, where, does people, where do people go to learn more about that? Uh, we have some documentation about that. It's a flexible workflow. 
uh, you can find some variants of that in the Fiori apps library. It's all the apps that are related to my inbox and specific approval scenario, uh, purchase order approval, purchase requisition approval. And you can also search for flexible workflow at uh, help.sap.com and you get okay. some information around it. Cool. And I was going to add to your your comment again about how do we how do you get you know adoption out there and, and I think in addition to the architect right you know the architect isn't always necessarily the champion but finding those champions right that really you know love it and adopt it and can speak to how it makes their jobs easier and using them to help you know get get that word out to others. I mean, again, I know I'm not a typical customer, um, but we we also, you know, over the years when we, when we first started to adopt Fiori in our demo environments, it was very hard, right? There was a lot of people that did not feel that, that Fiori, you know, Fiori was for them. There were no Fiori UI 5 apps for certain solutions in the beginning. And, you know, we, we really had to come up with almost a promotion. Um, we called it everything Fiori, right? And and the the message was, you know, whether you're, you have just Fiori you know, SAP GUI HTML transactions in the Fury Launchpad, or you have UI5 apps, the, you, you know, we should be, everything should be out of the, out of the Fury Launchpad. That is the single point of access for all of our solutions going forward. Um, so I think, you know, trying to find that, you know, marketing aspect of it, right? If finding your champions, leveraging them as, as spokespersons for what it can do for them. I mean, that's really big, you know, and then of course having that architect that can back them up and, and help always be looking for the latest and greatest. What's that new feature that's going to come out and that's going to really make a difference. And how do you get people to use those new features and get them excited about it? So um, that's some of the stuff we do in our, again, in our demo world. Yeah. So there is a question from Ram. Um, I think Polly would be good to answer that one. Um, around regression testing with gateway front end, like what, what is your recommendation on that one? Yeah, basically it come, comes back to the, to the deployment options, right? So the, um, that if, if there is a higher risk now with an embedded deployment compared to the, to the hub deployment we had earlier, um, for, for my point of view, I think that's a, that's a major difference when coming from the business suite now jumping to the S4HANA. Um, with S4HANA, it's, it's one solution, right? So Fiori is a UX of S4HANA. We are not speaking any longer as with a Fiori 1 on the business suite where we have single Fiori applications and you can connect them even to multiple backend systems. But we have one solution, that's S4HANA, and the UX of S4HANA is Fiori. So um, therefore, it had been just a logical consequence that we are saying um, we do not rip apart the solution in the in the front end piece and the and the back end piece, but we have it uh, delivered as one solution, um, and therefore we have the, the embedded uh, deployment option. And um, from a regression point of view, um, you are updating your solution all in in in, in once. So um, I do not see the, the, the higher risk of a, of a regression. And when you're doing an update of the um, sub UI 5, for example, um, on, a, on a hub or on, a, um, on, the, on the backend system, it's very similar from a regression risk point of view. Um, if you run into a regression, then you, could, uh, you can even on embedded deployment, very isolated, just update uh, or patch the, the UI components without touching the rest. So um, even with an embedded deployment, you are not forced to update the full stack or update the full system, but you have very good uh, means of just updating single software components um, so that there is no need to, to touch the full system. So um, from my point of view, um, we, are, we are not having any additional or introducing any higher risks or limitations by moving from the hub to embedded. It's more considering that on the business suite where the recommendation is still to go with the hub because you, were, you are there able to consume or have one app serving multiple backend systems that now on the um, S4HANA, we are not speaking any longer about single applications, but the full user experience of S4HANA and therefore our recommendation is to go embedded. Um, that's hopefully answering the question. Thanks, that was very good. All right. So everyone, we're getting close to the end here. We'll probably answer a few more questions, but in the meantime, what we will do is uh, uh, go ahead and share with you our screen for uh, answering and your suggestions here for future uh, Fury side chats. 
uh, you can go ahead and uh, either use the link that's in the chat uh, to, to enter this. And Eugen, in the meantime, you want to handle any remaining questions? Yeah. Perhaps there was one question uh, on top of this business suite and deployment question uh, in regards to some of the applications uh, from business suite and if, we, uh, if you are able to run them embedded as well. So um, until the front end server 6.0, all the or most of the business suite apps are supported as well. So um, if you have a front end server 6.0, you can run them um, on your embedded or on this front end server as well, be it on hub or embedded. Starting as of uh, front end server 2020, uh, most of the business suite applications are not longer supported on the front on this front end server release. Um, but you have to look into the details because there are some components, uh, for example, coming from uh, HR area, um, which are still still running and still supported there as well. So it's uh, something which we have to double check in uh, in detail uh, what's supported and what what not. There is a uh, SAP note available um, describing um, uh, or providing you with uh, with the full details. Great, thank you. So Sue, any uh, any kind of final thoughts from your perspective on on suggestions and? I guess I would say, you know, um, you, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of of Fiori, um, and. Um, I just, I, I, I guess you could say I'm an ambassador of it as well in Teams, yeah. um, and anyone that wants to bring, you know, a concern or objection to it, even in in our own internal pieces, I, I love to get those right because without that we can't improve. And so, um, you know, I challenge people to to um, to really, you know, embrace Fiori and 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 I hope our customers do as well. Great. And Javier, thank you so much for joining. You know, I'm, I'm always intrigued with the work that the rig does. I mean, it's such an important uh, uh, group to customers, partners, and SAP. Thank you so much for joining. Do you have any kind of final thoughts from your perspective? Yeah, I, I guess I'll say what I tell to all customers. Uh, just try it out. I'm also a full Fury supporter. But I know that uh, having this new UX expert, this new way of working may be a challenge. But something I've noticed is that uh, most customers like hearing uh, the what happened to other customers. My suggestion is just take that as an additional um, like experience, but don't base your decision on what other customers faced. Each customer has their own journey. Mm -hmm. So your journey may not, maybe will not be as troublesome as other customers. So just don't take those comments uh, as a full, uh, as, as indication of what's going to be wrong with your project. Try it out, see how it goes for you. If you like it or not, then tell us at SAP and we'll do our best to modify the solution to fit your needs. Thank you. Very good statement towards the end. So maybe to first to wrap up this call, thanks a lot to the panelists. That was great insight from you guys on everything, uh, how to make SAP Fiori applications and implementations very successful in the organization. Um, you have had like a lot of references to previous sessions that we actually already had. So maybe starting with next week session uh we have the next week's session will be around setting up sap fiori 3 so we heard uh in one of the previous sessions about spaces pages the launch pad uh so we will cover that topic of how that actually is working with fiori 3. um same time same place next week on a tuesday and if you missed one of the previous uh, fiori site chat sessions you can actually find it on that tiny url link uh, sap dash fiori dash site dash chat and um so you will find actually recordings the agenda for the next chats coming up and all the required login information uh, for the calls and with that um i would say thank you again to everyone for yeah, thank you so much great great questions from the audience so thanks a lot also to the audience for joining and and uh, being highly proactive during this call today uh thanks a lot and we see you next week